moving on uh, to our next guest. Uh, so Claire, please uh, join me here on the stage. So Claire is going to talk about feature launch messaging to maximize adoption. Uh, Claire, ho -ho, here you are. Hey, Pep. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm going to get out of your way. And uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sure everything has been super informative so far. And hopefully, what we're going to cover here is complimentary. Um, I did hear a shout out to April Dunford. Um, and there will be a quick, uh, quick mention of positioning in this. Um, but also want to plus one anything that referenced April Dunford's work. Um, her, her approaches are great. Uh, so nice to meet everyone. Um, as Pep mentioned, I am here to chat about uh, planning feature launch messaging to maximize adoption, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I know that can mean different things to different people. Um, so when I say feature launch, I'm, I'm really referencing my own area of specialty, which happens to be working with SaaS companies. Uh, but this is also applicable to launching a completely new product as a whole uh, or a new offering within other business models as well. So even if you're not within a SaaS team, um, this is still going to be useful to you. Um, so I'm going to start by defining exactly what we're going to be covering. Let me just make sure. Yep. OK, so things are working. So we're going to go through three main sections. Um, the third will be the most detailed and, and in the weeds. Um, but first, we're going to start with chatting about why feature launches often flop from what I've seen with different teams I've worked with in the past. Um, some effective prereqs or prerequisites um, to, to essentially help you make sure that you have the information you need ahead of time um, if you're going to create really strong messaging that, that does its job. Um, then we'll get into the meat of planning out message map planning out messages, mapping those messages throughout all the different areas of launching a feature, and then QA. Um, so like quality assurance, making sure your messages really will be effective. Um, I will drive home real quick before we continue that uh, this workshop is not really about copywriting in any way. There's tons of copywriting resources out there. Shout out to um, Joanna Weave at Copy Hackers as one, like probably my favorite example. Um, today's really about planning, planning the messages or the concepts you need to convey to resonate with the audience you're launching a feature to. I see that people are saying we can't see the slides. Thanks for the heads up. Didn't realize my screen wasn't shared. Glad we didn't get any further before I kept going. Um, I had my video shared, but not my screen. Love it when that happens. OK, give me one sec. Um, share screen. This should be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> is that better? Is everyone seeing, seeing this now? Cool. Thanks for the thumbs up. Um, awesome. Technical excitement. OK, going to keep going. Um, so now that that's all been covered, and thankfully we're only on slide two, <laughs> um, I'll jump into, the, I'll jump into the, the real meat of this. So I'm starting with this, this uh, quote here that Pop culture has attributed to Albert Einstein, though I, I don't actually believe it was him who said it. Um, but the concept is still very relevant. So whoever actually did say this quote um, said that if given an hour to solve a problem, they'd spend 30 minutes analyzing the problem, 20 minutes planning the solution, and then 10 minutes executing the solution. And I would consider, um, to what I just mentioned, the actual writing piece, um, the copywriting in developing messaging to be that execution piece. What we're going to talk about here is that analysis and planning. Uh, so to start with why feature launches often flop, um, quick, quick, like just thumbs up or show of hands, who has been involved in a, a feature launch before, um, with, whether within a SaaS product or other kinds of products? OK, I'm seeing some thumbs up. OK, awesome. Um, so in my experience in working with SaaS companies over the past I'm not going to do math right now, many years. Um, what I see often as a huge failure point, <laughs> I'm seeing some, some sad emojis, um, is very unclear communication about the goal and the importance of the launch, which results then in unclear expectations about what all is supposed to be created um, and how are we describing this thing, right? So um, you might have experienced either in a past workplace, you might be going through this right now based on some of the crying emojis that I just saw pop up. Um, but it's often the case that the team focused on building 
is likely in their, in their lane. Um, whereas those who are customer facing, marketing being just one example, are less aware of what's coming down, down the pipe. Um, and then the product team says, all right, we're ready to take this to market, run with it marketing, bring us new customers, bring us adoption, bring us super excited, engaged users. I'm getting some thumbs up. Um, so hugs to everyone, <laughs> hugs to the uh, crying emojis. Um, so the result of this, right, is that the people on the team responsible for launching that new feature or product to market don't actually have the time needed to plan all the communication assets required to make the launch a success and to drive adoption of a new feature that could have been a game changer. Um, so there can be a lot of misunderstanding around who the feature is most beneficial to. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that on a future slide. Um, but when situations like this arise, often teams find themselves in this, um, especially on the marketing side, on this crunch where they're expected to, you know, in a very short amount of time, pull off this huge, exciting launch wave that drives all this, all this new engagement. Um, but they're not prepared to do so because there hasn't been enough time to effectively plan. Which brings us to launches that are subpar, the customers or the audience you're trying to you know, drive new business with, with this feature, might not understand the value of what you've just launched, so they're gonna fail to care, and it doesn't drive the impact that it could. Um, I'm, uh, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. Have, have people experienced this? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I also have exp I've also experienced this. It's very, it makes your job very difficult. So let's talk about how you can avoid that situation. Um, so two prerequisites to planning high impact messaging around a new feature are alignment with teams cross-functionally on what the goal of, the, of launching the feature really is, and then alignment on what level of priority this launch actually is in comparison to everything else happening at the company from a, a marketing and, and product development perspective. Um, so we'll jump into both of these in a little more detail. Uh, starting with alignment on launch goals. In this context, what I mean is, what is the business goal that the launch of this feature rolls up to? Um, so of course, different types of features can have very different goals. Some might be launched with the goal of driving net new revenue, right? Like a, a feature that'll unlock a huge new segment of the market that your company previously hadn't been able to serve. Or at the other end of the spectrum, maybe this is more of like a catch up feature where you're trying to make up for a, a known weakness that exists in your product um, that lots of competitors have, you, you might not want to announce something like that um, or shout it from the rooftops publicly, right? That might just be some notifications to your current customers, letting them know, um, or reaching out to folks who churned because they needed that feature. Um, and knowing what those launch goals are impacts so much from a messaging perspective. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is which audiences need communication about a feature launch um, or a new product launch. So again, that could be the, the general public, right? The universe, uh, it could be your current customers. It could be people who churned uh, because they needed the key feature you didn't previously have um, or existing customers whose engagement is subpar, but they have requested this feature, right? So uh, product or customer support maybe has them on a list somewhere. Um, but you need to understand what those goals are so you know which of those audiences you're speaking to so that you can plan for each one and think through what messaging is going to make most sense from their point of view. Um, by the way, if, if you're listening to this and you have a product that you haven't yet launched um, and you're looking at this through the lens of a first launch, like a whole product launch, this is still super relevant. Um, is, anyone here, is anyone here in the process of like launching a new product as in like just to, to see whether I should dive into that? Got a plus one? Okay, cool. Um, so even, even in that scenario, you still likely have a couple of different audiences you want to be thinking about when you bring your product to market. Um, so you have a new customer's audience. You very likely have a beta customer list, right? Or maybe an existing list of people who are very early users. Um, you, might, you might have an, a list of people who are part of your own inner circle, um, advisors or investors or founders um, or friends, whatever it might be. So even if it's your very first launch, you're going to have right out the gate a couple of different people or audiences who need different forms of communication. So as a team, um, whether you are, you know, wh whether whether you are working on that product solo or whether you are 
thinking about this from a marketing perspective and trying to, in a more established org, coordinate with those on the product team, once there's alignment around what the goals of the launch are, it's very helpful to um, stick to that primary goal and then define what priority level the launch is going to be uh, with regards to you know, all the other features you might have coming down the pipeline. Um, so has anyone seen this, this like priority level matrix before? I did not invent this. This, this particular one is from an intercom article from a while ago. Um, regardless, it's cool. Okay, so I'm glad to see that folks are familiar with this. Um, I don't have to spend <laughs> too much time here. Um, but for those who haven't used this before and might wanna adopt this as a new tool, Alexandra is implementing it now. That's awesome, high five. Um, you can think of your launches in terms of priority one, two, three, or four. Um, you'll notice that four is not on here, uh, and I'll describe why in a moment, but priority one is your, your biggest announcements, right? So these are features that will solve customers' problems in entirely new ways. Um, they're the biggest opportunity to attract new customers or new markets even. Um, so you really wanna shout about these, right? All of your resources go into P1 launches. Priority two is solutions uh, to problems that are mostly gonna be valuable to your existing customers. Um, so they might be really sophisticated or, or powerful, but by themselves, they may not be as likely to convince a new customer to switch from your product over an existing solution. Um, so those become a bit lower on the totem pole um, in terms of you know, planning a big launch. And then priority three is things you ship to just fill gaps, right? So features and improvements that bring you up to par um, with other solutions in the market um, that existing customers may have already been asking for. Um, whereas priority four is bug fixes, performance issues, resolving technical debt. Um, unless you target engineers, uh, your customers likely are not going to care about these, um, although your engineering team or you, if you are an engineer, might be really thrilled about those things. So when you know your launch priority level, you can develop different messages as needed to communicate within as many different contexts as you need, right? Um, so press coverage messaging um, in you know, publications that are relevant to your industry, is gonna be very different and more high level than in-app messaging within your product to existing customers, right? So this is definitely a sample grid, as you can see here, but this represents you know, a, a list of activities um, or channels you may use depending on what level of priority launch a, a feature or a product takes. Um, now, what's important is this is definitely a template. Like this is, this is in no way the end all be all. Um, you are going to know your industry and, and your customers better than I will in this presentation. Um, so this should be adapted based on where the people in your universe spend their time and, and what channels you need to use to reach them. Um, but by planning this ahead of time, you set all this context and you create more space to actually develop the material needed in each of these locations, right? Um, that teams often don't have time for when the, the launch workflow is someone on the product team lets marketing know, hey, this is happening next week. We need you to like write a blog post. Um, I'm saying that from personal experience. <laughs> um, so this is where we get like the most, I would say, into the weeds the tear emojis, um, the most into the weeds or the most tactical here. Um, let's talk about really planning and, and mapping and QAing your messages um, to make sure that they're optimized for conversion. <laughs> Blog posts. Um, so there are three kinds of tools, I guess, that I, that I like to use to help guide this process. Um, the first is going to be your positioning brief. Again, quick shout out um, to other positioning uh, tools that, other, that folks use. April Dunford's uh, positioning resources are like top of the line. Um, I'll share one as well if that's useful. Um, but then the second is going to be mapping a, well, an experience map or a, a happy path for all the different audiences you're launching to. Um, and then the third is quality assurance, right? So making sure your messages are optimized for conversion across all those key audiences. So starting with the positioning brief, if it's useful at all, you can grab the one that I tend to use when I'm working with teams um, at this bit.ly link. Um, it is, it's sent, well, I won't, I won't go into it because you can, you can grab it, it's free. Um, but whatever, it's, whatever you might be launching, if it's anything from a priority one down to a priority three, 
be sure to fill this out. Um, and I heard right before I came on, um, someone talking about positioning as something that the CEO needs to take part in, right? Um, so the higher priority it is, especially if you're at a P1 level, your exec team should 100% be part of this process. Um, at the very least, teams who team members from both the product side of the house and the customer facing or marketing side of the house should be doing this together so that everyone's aligned across, across the team on how we talk about this feature. Um, and specifically, how we talk about it so that we describe how it solves people's problems, how it solves your customers' problems. Um, and so we don't get caught up in, the, in talking about the technicalities of the features, which is very easy to do as a team internally because we're so close to what's being built, right? So start with this. This will always give you a good central point for everyone within the company, no matter how big or small your company is, to go to to create marketing collateral or launch collateral uh, to start from, rather than everyone kind of making up their own like clever words and, and messaging lacking continuity and, and clarity. Realizing non-PMMs should attend this series as well. Yeah, yes. Um, happy to share the slides. Uh, I'm going to come back to questions. I'm getting. I'm going to. I'm going to get too distracted if I keep looking at questions. But let's go to that second resource or tool I like to use, which is developing a. It's a goofy phrase, but happy path. Uh, once there's internal alignment on what messages you're going to use to describe this feature or this new product, then you can go through the process of asking yourself literally what steps or what experiences is each of my core audiences going to go through from first learning about this feature to trying it out and 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 adopting it long term. And if they fall off, if they if they leave that happy happy path, what are some of the basic fallback communications that we need to put in place to get them back on track. Uh, and those fallbacks could be follow-up email sequences, um, fallback calls to action, like replacing a you know, sign up call to action with a schedule a setup call call to action, uh, retargeting campaigns, uh, depending on the, the type of business, it could be outbound phone call cadences um, at the more enterprise level. So let's talk about this in a, in a more visual way. Uh, I'm getting, okay, cool, so I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, so this slide, what we're looking at here is a visual representation of a happy path I worked with a team to create a couple years ago. Um, so this I helped develop uh, with a company called AutoBooks. AutoBooks is basically uh, payment processing tools for small businesses, specifically like super local or regional businesses. So someone who owns a cupcake shop, or someone who owns, um, you know, a small chain of like, you know, pet groomers, things like that. Um, so AutoBooks offers invoicing, billing management, um, most critically, which I'll go into further, they offer the ability for these small, often brick and mortar businesses to take credit card payments directly into their bank account, rather than going through like PayPal or Square or something similar. So. I was working with AutoBooks to release this, this new feature that they called Payment Form. Um, and Payment Form is basically just a simple static URL that if you're one of their small business customers, you can take and paste anywhere. So you can paste it on your Facebook page, on your website, you can text it to your customers if you do like, you know, landscaping, for example, and you're often like there in person. Um, and your customer can go to that URL, enter their credit card, um, and the payment goes straight into the, the small business's bank account. So it's not held with PayPal, it's not held with Square um, or anything like that. So this was going to be a major P1 launch for our audience, because if you think about some of these like hyper-local businesses, they're mostly used to like printing invoices, they're used to checks, they're used to cash, they're very PayPal uh, skeptical. Um, you know, fees and, and a company holding on to their money that was very like that was that was high tension. So introducing this idea that people could get paid automatically at a link was going to be massive for this particular audience. Um, so we had to figure out how are they going to actually interact with this new feature uh, that we called payment form. Um, so I've highlighted in pink, as you can see, the, the announcement email, the landing page and then an app queues call out within the product, um, these were the areas that we as the growth and marketing team could impact. Um, so you can see we didn't have the ability to 
um, impact every step, but we could touch a couple. Um, and you can see that their happy path included getting an email from us, clicking an email, going to that landing page, um, which we could influence. And then the next step, next couple of, of blue steps are customer actions. Um, but eventually then they reach an app queues overlay that we do have the ability to impact. Um, so these were all the places we then knew we had to craft messages to drive these users from one step to the next, right? So we had this holistic picture of how our messages needed to guide people rather than, you know, we sent a launch email and somebody else is working on that landing page over there and someone else is doing the dashboard. It was all holistic, right? Um, and I recommend doing this for every segment you're going to launch to, um, which we'll talk through here. So we went through this series of conversion practices after we mapped out that path. Um, so we asked, who is the user we're speaking to? Um, what are the messages that, that have to go into this space? Um, uh, sorry, give me one sec. Something popping up on my screen. Um, in terms of the user really quickly, who is my user? Um, you might be able to see th that the audience this path was designed for was called accessible SMBs. Um, what that what that means is autobooks. So <laughs> this is a, I'll I'll try to speed through this, but the way autobooks works is that it integrates with um, a bank or a credit union, um, and then that bank or credit union has a big list of small business customers. Um, so those are accessible small businesses. Um, so it's a bit of a B to B to C play, but. Um, this path was designed for those accessible small businesses. Um, so anyway, going back to defining who that is and then asking what's that person's stage of awareness, level of intent, and are we giving them the information they need to take action? So who is familiar with the stages of awareness uh, in terms of positioning, messaging, copy? Is this a familiar concept to anyone here? Um, seeing a couple thumbs up. Okay, sweet. Um, so some people, yes. Okay, sweet. Um, very, very briefly for, for anyone who is new to this concept, um, you wanna start by making sure, uh, sorry, give me one second. Again, just something kind of in my way on my screen. Um, so let's talk about what unaware means at a very, very, in a very brief way. Cool, more thumbs up. Yes, the, we use the idea. Okay, sweet. I'll, I'll keep this part very brief. Unaware, people who have no idea who you are don't even realize they have the problem that you solve. Right, so they're going to need a lot more information to even become interested in what you have to offer. Um, problem aware, people who might feel the problem that your new feature or new product solves, um, but don't really don't really know solutions are available out there. Um, solution aware, people who are using other solutions to solve the problem that your new feature or product solves. Product aware, they're aware of you against other products. And then most aware is people who are very ready to take action. They're super informed. You just need to tell them what to do and get out of their way. Keep speeding by since it looks like a lot of folks are familiar with that idea. Um, so then on, on top of that, we layer levels of intent. Um, the lower the level of a user's, uh, the lower a user's level of intent, the more work your messages are going to have to do to move them to action. So an example would be uh, a customer receiving a feature launch email totally out of the blue, um, they're probably very likely low intent. They weren't actively seeking out that feature. Um, or a counter example being a user or a customer who has requested a feature multiple times in the past, knows they need it, and are gonna be super excited and high intent when they get the email saying, hey, we finally have this. Uh, the messaging for each of those people is gonna be different, right? Um, medium intent is, is people who they could take action, uh, but they need a little bit convincing. Um, so you wanna lead a bit more with why what you are introducing is important to them and then transition into how to take action. Um, so I'll show some differences uh, on a future slide between where high and low intent come into play um, when you're planning your launch messaging. Um, final thing uh, or final kind of like tool that I'll share here um, is I, I know I mentioned, a, I, I gave Joanna Weeb at Copy Hackers a shout out earlier, I'm gonna give her one more. Um, but a, a long time ago, like years ago now, um, she published this messaging hierarchy, which is essentially a tool to help you think through what are all the details, someone reading your communications, your landing page, your email, whatever, 
what's, what are all the details they might need to actually be ready to take an action? Um, the less aware and lower intent someone is, the more of these questions they'll need answers to before they're ready. The higher intent and the more aware, solution aware, product aware they are, the fewer of these questions need answers. Um, so all of these get mixed in and actually applied to that happy path that you mapped out, right? And what you get is this, this map where your messages are continuous and flow from one to the, another, one to the next um, and guide someone from being maybe the least aware, whoops, my screen go away, there we go, um, from being least aware all the way to most aware, from being potentially low intent all the way to, all the way to ideally pretty high intent, right? Um, now, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna show just one piece of collateral that was a part of this launch um, that, that we, we ran through together with AutoBooks where we introduced payment form for the first time. This email was crazy long. Um, the head of customer acquisition saw it and he was like, no way, I do not like this. We cannot send it, it's too long. It totally freaked him out. Can we see how long the, the screenshot preview is of the <laughs> email over there? Um, he was like, are you crazy? Nobody reads emails this long. Um, and I was like, let's just test it. If it doesn't work, like if it doesn't work with a small sample of people, then we can, re we can revise and we can, we can try again. Um, is there a link to read the email? I will, I will look for one. Um, I'm not sure if it's still in existence. This was a couple of years ago, um, but I will look for one if I can, if I can share it. Um, the point is though that the reason it was so long is that it was informed by all those different inputs we just walked through together. Who's the user, stage of awareness, level of intent, and info they're gonna need, right? So because they were pretty unaware and problem aware and low level of intent, they needed answers to all those different questions to take action. So we used all of these tools to make that assumption or test that theory with this email. Um, and I'll go to one, like just like, I think I have just two or three more slides left. Um, but from the launch month, to the following month, so just 30 days, we tested this email, it went pretty well in a small group, so we, we used it to, the, to, to launch to our larger audience. So from, from launch to the following month, the number of, what's my, what do my notes say? Sorry, I'm gonna butcher the, the phrasing, but the number of payments processed through this new feature, this payment form, across the customer base of existing customers and new signups jumped up 300%. <laughs> um, there had been a couple of users in beta testing it out behind the scenes. And then when we rolled it out with this email, this was like, this was the result we saw. And then in about two months after the launch, so there was the initial launch and then there were ongoing communications um, and the reusage of this email to different audiences um, in slightly different ways. About two months after the launch, 30% of the entire customer base had started using this new feature, this payment form feature. Um, so they ended up seeing so much success from this email that had really scared the head of acquisition um, that they adopted it into the, the main onboarding sequence for all new signups. Um, so I know that we're right at the top of the hour. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to answer questions because I know there's another speaker uh, right behind me. Um, but if it's helpful to have access to those conversion best practices, I've also got a resource for that. So if you want to grab that at this bit.ly link, you are more than welcome to. And thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, How do I get joined on stage? There we go. Hey, Pat. <laughs> Unfortunately, indeed, we're out of time to, for questions. However, you're fully active and fully vaccinated, uh, according to Twitter. On Twitter. I am. <laughs> so, uh, please uh, chase her down on Twitter, ask her questions there, give her a follow, and Claire, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks so much for, for inviting me to join. See you on Bye -bye. Twitter, everyone.